The Kyle Rittenhouse trial is officially underway and the opening statements are already something very interesting to analyze. <laughs> Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and this is Winnie the Westie, and Kyle Rittenhouse's trial started today, and the opening statements are already something very, very interesting to analyze. In the context of the trial, because the defense has the option of whether or not it chooses to give its opening statement first, the defense let the prosecution give its opening statement first, and then the defense followed, and I know a lot of people on social media are giving the defense a hard time in their opening statements. While it may not have been a home run smashing the ball out of a ballpark. I don't think it was actually a blown opportunity. It might have been a missed opportunity, but I don't think they actually did any damage to the case. But the prosecution's opening statement could very well serve as the self-defense argument for Rittenhouse. Like it or leave it, regardless of how you might feel about Kyle Rittenhouse, the prosecution has some very unfortunate facts in this case, and that would be that two of the three individuals who were shot were not the most savory of characters, to put it mildly. Two of them had criminal records one of them had a very, very bad criminal record. The one who had a very bad criminal record was apparently released from a hospital, a mental hospital, that day was apparently, even up to the prosecution's own admission, up to no good. He was chasing down Rittenhouse. He was telling people to shoot him. He was using a certain word that you would not use under any normal circumstances, let alone at a BLM protest. And some might dare say he was out looking for trouble and found it. That individual was Jeffrey Rosenbaum. And by all accounts, the guy was out looking to instigate something, and whether or not he got more than what he asked for, whether or not he got more than what he deserved, he certainly went out instigating something with Rittenhouse, and he got what he got from Rittenhouse. The evidence will show that Mr. Rosenbaum is agitating. He is getting in people's faces. He is using obscenities. He is essentially daring people to respond. In fact, at ultimate gas, I believe the evidence will show that he actually gets right up in the face of armed people who are similarly armed as the defendant, who have similar AR-15 type rifles on, and he is literally confronting them in their faces. None of those folks shoot him. Another one of the unfortunate facts of this case is that the other individual who was shot and killed, Anthony Huber, chased down Kyle Rittenhouse, tried to smash him, or did in fact smash him over the head twice with his skateboard, tried to take his firearm, and then got shot in the process. And another unfortunate fact for the prosecution is that the third individual who was shot through the bicep but survived Gage Grosskrauts, he had a firearm with him at the protest, and he was, by his own admission, looking to empty that into Kyle Rittenhouse, and when he pulled out the weapon, that is when Kyle Rittenhouse shot him through the arm. But these are not the only unfortunate facts of the prosecution by any means. Now, I missed this live and was catching up on it in the afternoon, and I was tweeting out as I was watching this, some of the statements the prosecution was making seem to be perfect examples of self-defense arguments for Kyle Rittenhouse. Prosecution's opening statement in Rittenhouse trial really makes it sound like obvious self-defense. Downplaying the attack on Rittenhouse, just a little rioting, just a little assault, just an armed man attacking Rittenhouse at close range, not a strong open for the prosecution. The evidence will show that hundreds of people were out on the street experiencing chaos and violence, and the only person who killed anyone was the defendant. The evening begins with large-scale protests, large-scale, um, no other way to put it, rioting that's occurring right outside these windows, right in front of the courthouse here at Civic Center Park. There is a crowd of police that have lined up to protect this building, to protect the public safety building, which is right next door. And there are a large number of protesters that are agitating. They are screaming at the police. They are throwing projectiles. Police are shooting rubber bullets, tear gas, etc. It is a very volatile situation at Civic Center Park. And I'm not being hyperbolic or exaggerating here. The prosecution in their opening statement literally said things like, yeah, there was a little bit of arson going on. There was a little bit of rioting going on. Some of these people had set fire to a dumpster and were pushing it into a gas station. One of the individuals chasing down Kyle Rittenhouse had a concealed firearm. The other one was trying to smash him over the head with a skateboard and take his gun. But Kyle Rittenhouse did not react reasonably when he shot them seemingly in self-defense. And the prosecution went even further than that in their opening statements in an attempt to get ahead of 
these bad facts, but in so doing, I think is just making a perfect case for self-defense. At one point, the prosecution literally said this, quote, the evidence will show that this is a crowd that is not a safe crowd to be in. This is a crowd that does not view him as an ally. This is a crowd that if Rittenhouse ventures out into it, there could be problems. This setup is quintessential victim blaming, mutatis mutandis. Clearly there's antagonism. It is clear that this is a crowd that is not on the same side as the defendant, that does not see him as an ally, does not see him in his group as someone that they identify with. And as I said, there is a hostile inter exchange there for a while. In fact, at one point, members of the crowd pull one of the dumpsters from the property out into the street and attempt to start it on fire. And some of the other folks that are there with the defendant go out and put the fire out and have some very harsh interactions with those people in the street. Now there is getting ahead of the bad facts, which I think is strategically beneficial, and then there is just improper framing, which I think is strategically detrimental. In this situation here, you basically have the prosecution saying that it was Kyle Rittenhouse's fault for being in a situation of a crowd that did not view him as an ally, and that would basically beat him if they had the opportunity. And when I say that this is basically victim-blaming mutatis mutandis, it's tantamount to saying, well, you shouldn't have been in the crowd in the first place, you shouldn't have been at that bar in the first place, you shouldn't have been out late at night in the first place, so what happened to you is your fault. The prosecution is literally starting out by saying that the crowd was the enemy to Rittenhouse, that if Rittenhouse was in that crowd, unsupervised, without his own defenses, he would probably become a victim to that crowd. Well, that is setting up a grounds of self-defense that makes Rittenhouse's actions possibly seem a little more justifiable under the circumstances. But the prosecution doesn't even stop there, and they go one step further. Quote, Mr. Zeminski, for reasons only he can explain, decided to take his handgun and fire it one time in the air, end quote. 2.5 to 2.6 seconds between firing the gun in the air and Rittenhouse firing four shots at Rosenbaum, shirtless man who was chasing Rittenhouse. This is the prosecution's opening. Mr. Zeminski, for reasons only he can explain, decided to take his handgun and fire it one time in the air. In the context of setting out the facts, the prosecution says that not only were people chasing down Rittenhouse, there was this one guy, Zeminski, who for whatever the reason, pulled out a gun and shot it in the air. Only Zeminski knows why he did that, but Rittenhouse, when he turned around, saw Rosenbaum, a shirtless man, out of his mind, looking to instigate something, chasing down Rittenhouse, and that's when Rittenhouse fired four shots at Rosenbaum. As far as I am concerned, what the prosecution is setting out here, for me, a person with an open mind is a situation in which Rittenhouse clearly fears for his life and felt that he had no choice but to shoot at Rosenbaum, a man who was charging him after he heard a gunshot go off. Now, something that the prosecution said early on in its opening statements, which caught my ear a little off guard, is that they said that Rittenhouse shot Rosenbaum in the back, and that's how Rittenhouse killed Rosenbaum, and they started off with that big statement, which caused me to take a step back and say, whoa, I didn't know that Rittenhouse shot Rosenbaum in the back. If true, that would be a big fact, because I think it might be a little more difficult to claim self-defense when you are shooting someone in the back, and it was only a little later on into their opening statement that the prosecution actually had to admit, had to recognize that Rittenhouse shot four shots at Rosenbaum in the period of less than a second, something like three quarters of a second, and three shots went off, and as Rosenbaum fell forward, that's when the fourth shot hit him in the back. So it wasn't as though Rittenhouse shot a fleeing Rosenbaum in the back point blank like the prosecution initially alluded to. And this is one of those situations where the prosecution said something that set something of an expectation in my head as to Rittenhouse's culpability, and when the prosecution explained how exactly it came to be that Rosenbaum was shot in the back, well, then I was left feeling that the prosecution somewhat oversold the shot in the back aspect of this situation. We're not sure which order they were in, but one was to his right pelvis, fracturing his pelvis, and one was to his left lower thigh. Dr. Kelly will testify that these wounds caused Mr. Rosenbaum to start falling face forward. And you will see video of his body where it is found. He lands on his face, face down on the ground. As he is falling, falling the defendant fires two more shots. One of them hits the defendant in the back, or I'm sorry, Mr. Rosenbaum in the back, and that is the shot that kills Mr. Rosenbaum. So in terms of delivery, I might give credit to the prosecuting attorney for having good cadence, good presentation, good style, but on the substance, I think the prosecuting attorney really built a very compelling argument for self-defense, and I especially think the prosecuting attorney made a big mistake in overselling the idea that Rosenbaum was shot in the back, because when the defense came in, they made it very clear that he was not shot in the back, point blank, fleeing, he was shot in the back because four shots went off, and the fourth one hit Rosenbaum in the back as he fell forward, which 
which brings me to the defense's opening statement. After being kicked in the head by jump kick man with his skateboard. And on the subject of cadence and delivery, I think whatever the prosecuting attorney had in terms of style, the defense attorney lacked in terms of style, but I am a substance over style kind of person. I just think that the cadence, the delivery of the defense attorney was not exactly all that it could have been. That being said, on the substance of the defense, I think the defense attorneys did a good job just bringing up the factual elements of this entire situation, that these were people out looking for a fight. These were people looking to instigate something. They chased down Kyle. They assaulted Kyle, one with a skateboard, the other with a weapon. After he pretended to have nothing in his hands, he tried to pull out a gun to shoot Kyle. I think the defense attorney did a good job bringing out all those basic factual elements that would lead a reasonable jury to give an acquittal on the basis of self-defense. The prosecuting attorney might might arguably have gone a little bit overboard in terms of hyperbolic rhetoric when he was describing how the person with the skateboard was trying to separate Rittenhouse's head from his body. Some people might think it was a little hyperbolic. I, on the other hand, know how much damage someone can do with a skateboard. I know from experience, from a friend in high school, and I know from having seen a lot of videos on the internet, getting smashed in the head with a skateboard is no laughing matter. He hit him with the skateboard as he was running down Sheridan Road, and then as he's laying prone, on the ground, he comes in for another hit on his head and then grabs Kyle Rittenhouse's firearm to try and take it away from him. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to be able to hold up that skateboard in front of you as evidence today because then you could see it. You could see the weight and the heft of what a skateboard is. And what that skateboard would do is somebody takes it in their hand and swings down on somebody's shoulder, head, and neck, trying to separate the head from the body, as Mr. Huber did. But Your Honor, I'm going to object to the argument here, Your Honor. This is this is straying beyond a characterization of the evidence, and it's Mr. Richard's interpretation as an argument. In terms of delivery and style, I might give the defense attorneys a subpar grade, but in terms of the factual aspects of it, I would give them a pretty decent grade. But one thing, they missed an opportunity to frame this lawsuit as being one of calling into question the right to self-defense in the first place. They missed an opportunity to depict this lawsuit as the quintessential example of whether or not Americans have any self-defense rights, any gun rights to begin with, that if Kyle Rittenhouse gets convicted for this, and if this is not self-defense, Americans have no right to self defense any longer. I definitely know of some lawyers who would have seized on the opportunity to properly frame what is at issue, not just for the defendant, but for all Americans at large. So in that sense, it might have been a missed opportunity. But alas, I don't think there were any major screw-ups from the defense. I just think they might have missed that particular opportunity in their opening statements. But being someone who has been following this from the beginning in more detail than most people out there, having been following this from the beginning, I can say, in my humble opinion, this is the clearest cut case of self-defense, and if Kyle Rittenhouse gets convicted, then there will be no right to self-defense of any American in America. Some people might believe that Rittenhouse ought not ever have been out there in the first place with a firearm. That is a fair belief, but once he was out there, under the circumstances in which he found himself, the question is going to be whether or not he reacted in self-defense, fearing for his imminent death or bodily harm, being chased down and struck by someone with a skateboard, someone with a concealed firearm, and another individual who seemed hellbent on getting Kyle Rittenhouse. That is what is at issue. We're going to have one heck of a trial to follow, so stay tuned for some follow-ups. And if you like my videos, you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and drop a comment in the comment section below because it feeds the algorithm. Please, sir, I want some more. If you want to support the channel, all of the support links are in the pinned comment. We've got merch. Robert Barnes and I do live streams every Sunday. We do weekly streams with a guest every Wednesday called The Sidebar. You can find us and support us on Locals at BeaverBarnesLaw.Locals.com All of my content is also on Rumble, so you can catch it there. But more important than anything, take care of yourselves. Check in on friends and family. Make sure everyone around you is doing well. And now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah!